Today we're going to cover the, the basic anatomy of uh, a muscle fiber, which will be the most important thing for lecture tomorrow, unfortunately, as I've already, uh, I've already said, the, uh, the model for the muscle fiber, uh, which would be the most instructive for you, has disappeared. Uh, villainy and calumny abound. Uh, but we'll, we'll go through the anatomy anyways. And then, uh, less important to me is knowing the actual um, muscles on the body, but we will um, go cover some of the more interesting and important ones. Oh, by the way, I, <clears throat> I couldn't remember yesterday uh, what the word zygoma uh, means the, for the zygomatic bone in the face. And if it helps you at all, it probably will not help you. But it means yoke. It's the Greek word for yoke. Uh, yoke, there's a Y in yoke. There's a Y in zygoma. And in fact, they are related to one another. Uh, zygoma means yoke. And it is the yoke that holds the uh, facial bones to the uh, cranial bones. The um, Here, give me a skull, would you? The zygoma, or the cheekbone, if you look on this uh, plastic guy here, uh, you'll see this is the zygoma. There's that boundary between them where the it's called the temporal process of the zygomatic bone meets up with the zygomatic process of the temporal bone. Um, anyways, the zygoma uh, is the yoke that holds the facial bones onto the cranial bones. Uh, if that helps you at all remember zygoma. Uh, skeletal muscle. All right. So skeletal muscle uh, has... Um, some unique characteristics. It is striated. That is not completely unique to skeletal muscle. Cardiac muscle is also striated. Uh, smooth muscle is not. There are three muscle types, right? Skeletal, smooth, and cardiac. Skeletal muscle is uh, striated like cardiac muscle, but uh, it has the unique feature of being a multi-nucleate. It has many nuclei. So when we look at this uh, depiction of skeletal muscle here, we see what? What do you notice? Hopefully the things that I just pointed out, uh, that you have this striping. That striping. That is the striations. Uh, we will see what uh, that represents um, a little bit in a moment. And then there's this... Uh, dark spots all over the place, uh, those are nuclei. So a skeletal muscle has many nuclei. If you had to uh, guess why that is, uh, what would you guess? Uh, you don't, if you don't have an answer to that now, you can continue to cook on it, and I'll give you the answer eventually. But that's a question that I want you to think about the next uh, day. Why do they have so many nuclei? What advantage is that? Uh, what does that imply about the formation of uh, the skeletal muscle? Where else have we... Yeah? Okay, yeah, repair, sure, perhaps. Yeah, absolutely, repair. Uh, what else does it imply? Yeah? Just, just like what other cell? Do you remember what kind of cell? Osteoclasts, yeah. So osteoclasts form from the fusion of multiple cells, uh, multiple myeloid cells, and, and likewise, muscle cells came from the fusion of many cells. Uh, <clears throat> Liam, right? Yeah, Liam. Um, uh, suggests that it's due to uh, the ability, the need for it to repair well, why wouldn't one nucleus be able to be, to, to be sufficient for repair? I'm not telling you you're wrong. I'm just trying, telling you to hold fast, be brave, stand up to me. Why? I don't know. I guess muscles are weak. I guess. Okay. Okay. Let, I'll let you guys think about it some more. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna give you the the answer. We'll come back to it. I promise we will. He's on the right track. So here's cardiac muscle. 
striated, um, but uh, cardiac muscle has um, these boundaries uh, that separate one cell from another, and they are called uh, intercalated discs. We will I want to know how to get a better resolution out of that projector. Um, we will talk about those a bit more when we talk about uh, the heart, uh, but each myocardiocyte, cardiac muscle cell, each myocardiocyte has a single nucleus. So this is one of the ways you can distinguish cardiac muscle tissue uh, from uh, skeletal muscle. And the other is that there are these intercalated discs that uh, separate individual uh, cardiac muscle cells. They are both striated. They are both striated, um, which it ha is of functional significance, as we will learn. Who had anatomy and, and physiology in high school? Any of you? A couple of you did. So you've talked about a lot of this already. Uh, smooth muscle tissue. So smooth muscle tissue, like cardiac muscle, is mononucleate, single nuclei. But unlike uh, any of the other types of uh, muscle, it is not striated. Uh, we're not going to get into a deep discussion of the function, uh, the functionality of smooth muscle, uh, exactly how it works, but um, maybe a little bit tomorrow, maybe briefly. So, uh, in lecture today, I talked about uh, excitable versus non-excitable tissue. Non-excitable tissue would be uh, either epithelia or uh, some sort of connective tissue. And excitable tissue is either neuronal or muscle tissue. I talked mostly about neuronal tissue, although everything I said today applies uh, to both types of excitable tissue. Um, muscle tissue, unless it's cardiac muscle, uh, which can self-stimulate, skeletal muscle needs to be stimulated by, uh, the stimulus uh, comes from a neuron, and uh, there is what's going to be called a neuromuscular junction, a neuromuscular junction. Uh, at the beginning of the lecture today, I showed you that image of the bands of skeletal muscle with the, the telodendria spread out amongst them, the synaptic boutons. Uh, those were a depiction of, of this right here, the neuromuscular junction. Yeah, Gesundheit. All right, so here's another picture of the same thing. There are, there should be, I don't see, are there, oh yeah, there's some slides over here. Uh, I would have had them put more slides out. I, I want slides on each bench. I'm going to have to get with them and crack the whip a bit. But uh, these slides are, uh, I, there should be some slides of this on there that you can, uh, you can identify this. So this would be, these individual berries would be synaptic mutons. This would be a telodendria uh, leading up to the axon of here, this would be the uh, uh, smooth muscle fiber, and this entire region would be the neuromuscular junction. All right, both the muscle fiber and the neuron together. Yeah, Alan. No, there's no axon hook in this image because you can't see the, the the actual neuron is probably somewhere in a spinal cord and is is likely not even on this uh, slide. So motor neurons uh, can be quite long, right? I mean, they can stretch from somewhere in your spinal cord uh, all the way down to wherever the muscle is that you're, uh, that you're firing. And that axon hillock is going to be in the spinal cord in the dorsal root somewhere. So this is the model that I'm looking for that should be here. This is a picture of the model that's missing. And by golly, I'm going to try to find it. I have looked high and low for it. Um, if I can't find it, then I don't know what to say. It's not going to, I can't put it on the test if I don't have the damn model. But um, <clears throat> this is the model that we need to be able to talk about the microscopic anatomy. Uh, and I'm going to talk about it anyways, just so you at least learn it, even if I can't 
teach it to you because you need it for tomorrow. Um, so <clears throat> the exterior, the exterior of uh, the model is meant to be the plasma membrane of the muscle fiber. And in a muscle fiber, it has its own unique name. The Greek prefix S-A-R-X, sarx, is the word for meat, meat. Uh, so sarco, S-A-R-C-O, is the prefix that refers to muscle. All right? So the sarco lemma is the plasma lemma in a muscle fiber. Make sense? I wish I had an English word that uses S-A-R-C-O, but I can't think of one. If anybody else can think of a word that will trigger that memory uh, trace, you're welcome. Sarcolemma is the plasma membrane on the outside of the muscle fiber. It is excitable membrane. It is possible to, have, to trigger an action potential on uh, that membrane. And that action potential is stimulated here at... Uh, this neuromuscular junction. So this is the axon of a motor neuron. Here is the myelin sheath that has been cut away to remove the to reveal the axon. Here is, or perhaps this is the telodendria, I guess. Uh, this would be the synaptic bouton. The synaptic cleft is in here between the presynaptic uh, membrane on the neuron and the postsynaptic membrane on the muscle fiber. Distributed throughout uh, the muscle, these little red berries here are mitochondria. Mitochondria uh, are rife throughout a muscle fiber because of their uh, special uh, energetic requirements. They need lot, the muscles need lots of readily available uh, ATP. So, on the surface of uh, on the surface of the circle lemma, you'll notice uh, in this image these little invaginations, these uh, these pockets that uh, that go in from the membrane. They are uh, they are they communicate with these uh, painted blue tubes, which are called transverse tubules. There are these tubules that run transversely across the uh, uh, a transverse section across the muscle fiber, and the inside of a transverse tubule, that membrane that is the inside of a transverse tubule, is contiguous with the sarcolemma, with the outside of uh, the membrane. So if you were a teeny tiny uh, little traveler, you could walk across the membrane into one of these tubes and be in this tubular network uh, inside the muscle fiber. This uh, means that if you stimulate an action potential on the surface of the sarcolemma, and it's going to propagate over the surface of the muscle cell, that depolarization, that action potential, is going to continue into the cell itself, into the transverse tubules. And all those transverse tubules are going to depolarize. All right? Whatever membrane potential is here is here as well. All right? Does that make sense? So what we're doing with these transverse tubules is effectively increasing the surface area of uh, the cell membrane. And moreover, we're putting it in intimate contact with the functional elements inside the cell, the muscle, uh, the muscle fibrils, which are actually going to be the contractile elements in the muscle. Um, all right. <clears throat> so what else? This is a nuclei, there's only one of them depicted here, but they're, they're throughout a, a giant muscle fiber. Um, what else do I have on there? Motor end plate, yeah, okay, so uh, the motor end plate, you know, I, I call this the neuromuscular junction, that's sort of a general term for it, but uh, the motor end plate is the part of the sarcolemma that the, that the uh, it's essentially the, the postsynaptic terminal. It's the part that the neuron is going to attach to the motor. Um, what else is on? So in this, uh, in the presynaptic terminal, you see these little dots, these little balls. 
Those are synaptic vesicles that are going to be filled with a uh, neurotransmitter. Is, any, is there any uh, people with really good photographic memory, audio memory? Uh, I told you what the name of that neurotransmitter was in the lecture. Acetylcholine, thank you. Good, yeah. So these are going to be filled with acetylcholine. Nice job. Um, yeah, Schwann cell, I think I already said that. So uh, the, in the peripheral nervous system, this myelin is created by Schwann cells. Uh, and in the central nervous system, it's going to be an oligodendrocyte. We'll talk about that next week. But uh, I know this is a Schwann cell because it's attached to a muscle. And so that means it's got to be peripheral. Um, myelin sheath, transverse tubule. OK, yeah, terminal cisternum. So uh, when you look at, I guess before I get to that, let's just talk about these, these long pink columns that you see here. Uh, these pink columns are bundles of contractile fibrils, all right? And we call uh, these, these long bundles of contractile fibrils break themselves up into uh, functional units called the sarcomere, sarcomere. Uh, and this is what gives rise to the striation, the dark and the light bands. It is striping throughout a muscle fiber. Um, the sarcomere itself is made up of the alternating strands of actin and myosin. Actin is what are called thin filaments, and myosin are thick filaments. We're going to talk about their function tomorrow in lab in lecture. Uh, but the uh, actin is uh, in these light bands, the lighter bands, uh, you only find actin. And in the darker bands uh, is myosin and sometimes uh, some actin. Right? So the actin extends from the light bands into the dark bands. Dark, if it's dark, it is myosin uh, and maybe actin. And if it's light, it's only actin. Okay? Uh, so then there's these different regions uh, that spread themselves throughout the sarcomere that have functional significance, uh, which we'll talk about in detail tomorrow in lecture. But um, uh, they, uh, the, the, the important place is this zone of overlap, zone of overlap, uh, which is... Uh, the place where the actin fibers and uh, the myosin fibers overlap. So this lighter band, we call it the I band. The I band. I stands for isotropic. Isotropic. And the dark band is the A band. A stands for anisotropic. A-N isotropic. Uh, you want me to write those words down? See them? Isotropic. I-S-O-T-R-O-P-I-C. And isotropic is A-N-I-S-O-T-R-O-P-I-C. Tropic. Isotropic. Um, does anyone know what the word isotropic or anisotropic is? Okay, so uh, something that is isotropic has a directionality to it in space. All right, something that's isotropic has a directionality to it in space. And something that's anisotropic has no directionality in, in space. So, for example, um, if you had a glass of water and you were to imagine the water molecules tumbling around in uh, the water, the glass of water, there's no directionality to their tumbling. They're just tumbling in random directions, okay? Uh, whereas if you were to take a little helicopter from uh, a, a maple tree and you were to drop it, it would be spinning uh, with a, a sort of directionality to it as it fell uh, to the ground. So this anisotropic and isotropic refer to the way those different parts of the sarcomere interacted with polarized light. So uh, does anybody not know what I mean when I say polarized light? If 
you don't understand. Okay, polarized light. So the way light works, light um, is a wave as well as a particle. And that wave, say a photon is going in this direction, uh, light can have, uh, it can be an up and down wave, it can be a side to side wave, it can be all of the 360 degree orientations uh, in, in terms of its uh, polarity. So anisotropic light or unpolarized light is light that has all directionalities in terms of its, its uh, wave fluctuation as it propagates. Uh, and then if you polarize light, you put like a, a filter that has slits uh, on it and the light passes through it and only light that has a directionality that's parallel to the slits is able to pass. That's polarized light. So when you have, uh, say you had something that was a spiral uh, and you were looking at it in polarized light, that uh, the spiral is going to bend the polarized light in a certain direction, either to the right or to the left, depending upon the handedness of the spiral. Um, so in polarized light, when these people were first looking at mu muscle fibers with polarized light in a microscope, uh, these, the white bands, uh, were isotropic, meaning they bent polarized light in a certain uh, direction. So when they were changing the phase of that polarized light, the, uh, these light bands uh, it sort of had an iridescent shift to them, whereas the dark bands did not bend uh, polarized light, meaning there was no regular handedness to the spir spiralness. There was no symmetry, or uh, I shouldn't say that. There was uh, no symmetry breaking. I think it is. There was no uh, handedness to any of the, uh, of the molecular structure there. And so these early anatomists called the light band the I band for isotropic and the A band the anisotropic band. So it'll make more sense tomorrow when I actually show you the structures of these proteins. Uh, there's the zone of overlap, which is part of the A band. It's where the uh, actin and myosin overlap. Uh, uh, myosin is the motor protein, and actin is sort of the train track that the motor protein runs along. Uh, the H band is this little band in the middle of the A band where it's only myosin. So the uh, A band is made of zone of overlap and H band. Zone of overlap has actin and myosin, and H band has only myosin. You guys following this? And then uh, there's the Z line, which is just the zigzag line. Uh, Z stands actually for the German word Zuzemind. All these uh, early people were from Germany, actually. Uh, Zuzemind means uh, middle in German, uh, but I, I think of it as zigzag. It's the zigzaggy line that goes down the middle. And then M uh, line. No, Zuzemind doesn't mean middle. Mittel, M I T T. Uh, El means middle. That's the middle. The M line is the middle of the A band. Zuzemin means in between, I think. In between. It's the in between line. Is that right? You're German. You can speak German. Is that right? Zuzemin is in between? Yeah, yeah. I think it's in between. Pardon me. It's not middle. Yeah. M is for metal, it's in the middle of the, uh, of the A band, and Z is for Zeusamin, which is in between, uh, right there, in between sarcomeres. All right. So that's that model. Uh, I don't know if you're ever going to see it, uh, but that's the anatomy you need to know uh, what's going on tomorrow. Then there's this guy. Um, we're going to, so he is, or she, I guess, uh, is uh, going to be one of the best models to identify a lot of these uh, structures. Um, um, I have an arm, a leg. Uh, that's the only decent torso, a muscle torso that I have, and the only decent facial muscles that I have, although these two ones here on the sides also are facial muscles. Uh, let's go through the face a little bit. So, uh, 
Um, I cut out a lot of these. Uh, I left some. I may want to cut out some of the ones that uh, I left. So as you're going along, you may make, want to make notes in uh, for the, the lab outline as to which ones I'm, I'm striking. But um, so there's this muscle called the occipital frontalis. The occipital frontalis. The occipital frontalis is this muscle. Um, so in general, when you see lines on your skin, uh, the, the lines on your skin from the furrowing of, of skin are perpendicular to the directionality of contraction. All right? They're perpendicular to the uh, directionality of contraction. So when I go like this and you see these lines on my forehead, that's the frontal belly, frontal name for the frontal bone that it lays on top of, the frontal belly contracting and causing uh, these furrows in my brow, right? Because what am I doing? I'm lifting my eyebrows. It's contracting this way, so I'm getting lines that are perpendicular to uh, the occipital, uh, the frontal belly of the occipital frontalis. Now, uh, this is one muscle, and it's attached via this thing called the uh, epicranial aponeurosis. Uh, epicranial meaning on top of your cranium, uh, cranium aponeurosis. Uh, aponeurosis is a uh, tendinous sheet. It's a broad tendinous sheet that uh, connects uh, muscle to some other structure. So in this case, it's the frontal belly to the occipital belly uh, back here of the occipital frontalis. Uh, we call this epicranial aponeurosis. Uh, older uh, anatomical references call it uh, something uh, called the gallia aponeurotica. Gallia aponeurotica is like if you look in uh, Gray's Anatomy. And that word gallia, G-A-L-E-A, -E uh, then aponeurotica, based on that word there, aponeurosis. Gallia aponeurotica refers to um, the Gaelic... Uh, helmet. So uh, Gaul was uh, France and the northern part of Italy, uh, etc. And they used to have uh, a helmet that they would wear that I guess resembled the skull that it was sitting on top of. So they call it the uh, Gallia aponeurotica, but that term has fallen out of favor. <clears throat> All right. Um, orbicularis oculi. Orbicularis oculi. These are the muscles uh, that do this. Uh, they make you close your eyes tightly. Uh, orbicularis oculi, the muscle that surrounds the eye. When it contracts, it, it closes. Uh, it closes down around uh, the, the eye. Uh, what else? The temporalis. Temporalis muscle, easy, because it lays right on top of the temporal bone. Um, put your hands on your temporalis, and what, what does it take, what do you have to do, what motion do you have to do to get that temporalis muscle to engage? So it's right up here, kind of just behind your ears. What do you have to do to get the temporalis to actually engage? Clench. Clench. So the temporalis muscle is a muscle of what's called mastication. Does anyone know what it means to masticate? To chew. Yeah. The temporalis is a muscle of mastication. <clears throat> um, as is the appropriately named masseter. The masseter. So stick your hand on the angle of your jaw, and you can feel the masseter. It's a muscle of mastication. The master. Uh, what else do I have here? So I've got the buccinator. The buccinator. So stick your finger uh, just behind the corner of your, uh, your lips, the, the, the junction of your lips, and whistle. That's your buccinator that's, that's helping you to do that. 
um, and in conjunction with the orbicularis oris. The orbicularis oris is the one, is the kissing muscle. Pucker up. Much like the uh, orbicularis oculi, it clenches up and closes the orifice of your mouth. Um, oh, so buccinator, you can remember buccinator because buckle, it, the buccal region, I told you in the beginning of the class, what means cheeks, all right? So the buccinator lays beneath your cheeks. Uh, we talked about sternocleidomastoid yesterday, didn't I? So it goes from the mastoid uh, down, there's a sternal head and a clavicular head. <clears throat> Clavicle, uh, it, they, say, they call it clido, that refers to clavicle. Uh, clavicle is, uh, like in Spanish, is claves. What are the claves? Does anyone know sp Spanish instruments? It's those, it's the bones, basically, that you uh, knock. But it's, it, it refers to the Latin word for key, because the, the Latin, the Greeks, no, pardon me, the Romans, uh, used to make keys out of the clavicle. Resourceful, those Romans. Uh, and then there's the trapezius, a trapezoid-shaped muscle. Let's look on uh, this muscly person here. Trapezoid, trapezoidal-shaped muscle, broad sheet of muscle uh, going across uh, the back. Uh, trapezoids help to lift the shoulder blades, help to lift the shoulders and draw uh, them in towards the midline. Um, I left zygomaticus major on there. I'm not sure if I've ever even asked that question on the test, but I might as well tell it to you down there. Uh, zygomaticus major, this is the smiling muscle. Zygomaticus major. It just pulls the corner of the cheeks up, to, uh, the corner of the lips corner of the mouth, pardon me, up towards uh, your zygoma. Zygomaticus major. I'm moving on from the face here. No, 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 I'm not. I got another one. Um, what else is new here? Oh, yeah. Well, this is a fun one to say just because the word supercilii is in there. Supercilii, I like it. Uh, corrugator supercilii. Corrugator supercilii. I say it a couple times. It's fun. Corrugator supercilii. Uh, it, it's the one that furrows your brow, like this way. How am I doing it? Like that. It's hard to do, not do other muscles. That's right. You got it. Corrugator supercilii. Um, <clears throat> what else? Um, yeah, I didn't do the platysma. Platysma is fun, but I'm going to tell you one that's, I don't have labeled, you don't have to memorize it, but I just like saying it. Uh, this muscle right here is called um, levator labii superioris alecinesi. It's the longest named muscle in the body. It's the one that's like smelly, smelly thing. Ugh. It does this. Corrugate, no, levator labii superioris alecinesi. Um, okay, so in the torso, uh, the obliques are important muscles. Uh, we have on the surface the rectus abdominis. When you see the word rectus, rectus means straight, straight. Uh, the straight muscles of the um, uh, the straight muscles of the abdomen. Uh, they are uh, they are attached uh, to one another by this little aponeurotic band called is a tendinous inscription, and then down the middle that line uh, that is so enviable uh, to so many people down the middle. Uh, it's called the linea alba, uh, the white line, alba, albino, linea, line, line, white, linea alba. Just 
down the middle. Um, so yeah, rectus abdominis, uh, and then uh, going to the uh, the next one is the external obliques, and the external obliques uh, have so yeah, the external obliques make uh, kind of an A shape in terms of their fibers. If you're looking at them, they they uh, radiate down, they radiate out more horizontally as they travel down, but through most of the range of the external obliques, uh, no, the internal obliques, that's the internal obliques. External obliques is the next one, pardon me, and that's the V. Get this, I get it backwards. I don't trust, uh, I shouldn't trust my eyes, I should trust my brain. Uh, the, the external obliques are a V that goes up, uh, and you can think of that as vertical, I guess. They make a V, the external obliques heading upwards. And then the internal obliques uh, are kind of make an A in terms of their fiber distribution down. Uh, they're not really revealed very well there. The serratus anterior, if you were to uh, uh, raise your arm and look at the muscles on the side of your torso, you can see them here quite well. Serratus anterior. There are these. I have to take some time with that model, but uh, they're the serrated muscles. When you see somebody who's uh, in in good shape, uh, you'll see the the kind of uh, ribbing that goes along the side at the, as these muscles attach to their ribs. It's called the serratus or serrated uh, anterior. Often, and here and here's a you know, here's a little uh, rule of thumb, but not a law that when you see a term that is the something and such anterior or the this and that thing superior, that means there's probably a something and such posterior or inferior. There's usually an opposite to it. So there, in fact, is a serratus posterior a muscle, which you're not responsible for, um, just so that you know. That's not always the case, though. There, For example, in the ear, there's an anterior and a posterior semicircular canal and a superior semicircular canal, but there's no inferior uh, semicircular canal. All right, next. Um, so there's the diaphragm. Uh, this is looking, um, what is this? This is the superior view uh, looking at uh, the diaphragm. And what I want to point out here is uh, two things. First of all, there is the esophagus that passes through what's called the esophageal hiatus in the diaphragm. This diaphragm is the muscle that uh, contracts, uh, comes down like this, filling the lungs. Right? So the diaphragm contracts and you fill the lungs by increasing the volume of the chest. Uh, and the esophagus passes through it in what's called esophageal uh, hiatus. Uh, what else is in there? Here's the central tendon of the diaphragm. Um, I, don't, I don't think a whole lot else. The inferior vena cava also passes uh, through the, uh, the diaphragm, diaphragmatic tendon. Um, all right. So, again, these are like, these are bread and butter muscles. Uh, anybody who's done any kind of uh, concerted weight training has heard of these muscles, I'm sure. Uh, the pectoralis major is the large muscle of the chest that you build when you uh, do bench presses. Uh, the deltoid is the delta-shaped muscle of uh, the shoulder. Uh, delta meaning a triangle. The deltoid. Uh, there are three heads uh, to the deltoid. Um, latissimus dorsi. Latissimus dorsi. Uh, let's see if I can find a good depiction of it. Well, you see the latissimus dorsi uh, here on this model as, don't lose your buttock, buddy. Um, the, it's this broad muscle that's not the trapezius. It's this broad uh, muscle sheet here. Uh, this is not a good view of the latissimus dorsi. 
the, it's mostly on the back. It's a muscle of the back. Latissimus dorsi spreads across the back from the midline up through the armpit and inserts on the humerus and helps you pull your arm back like this. Helps you pull your arm back like this. So for example, if you were, uh, if you were, uh, if you wanted to exercise latissimus dorsi, you would uh, take a weight like this and pull the arm back, uh, pull it up and back, and that would be your, your latissimus dorsi. Like if you were lifting something up, uh, if you were facing down or pulling something, pulling a door open, for example, would be using your latissimus dorsi. Uh, all right, so here's a better view of the latissimus dorsi, although it's not labeled. This would be latissimus here. Trapezius, the big trapezoidal uh, muscle of the back, uh, and, just, and just deep to it is the latissimus dorsi wrapping around. Uh, this is going to be some serratus in there that you can't see. This muscle is the infraspinatus. Now, the infraspinatus is part of what's called the rotator cuff. Now, if you take your hand and you put it on your opposite shoulder, you're going to feel a bony ridge across there, aren't you? Feel that bony ridge? That bony ridge is uh, part of... Bony ridge is part of your scapula. In fact, it's called the scapular spine. The muscle that is below that, so if you just take your fingers and you go just inferior to that, you feel that muscle that's right on the scapula but just below that bony ridge, that's infraspinatus. Feels good. That there, uh, with the cold weather. So it, it, part of the rotator cuff comes across and inserts on the humeral head. And then the, in, the supraspinatus, which I don't have labeled here, is the muscle that's underneath the trapezius, because the trapezius inserts onto that scapular spine, but just deep to it would be the supraspinatus. Supraspinatus, uh, also part of the rotator. Um, right. Then uh, this view gives us a little bit of a, uh, this uh, gives us a little bit of a depiction of the triceps, or three-headed muscle of the arm, triceps brachii, three-headed mu muscle of the arm. There are three heads to the tricep. The tricep, so if the bicep and the brachialis are the muscles that uh, you're using to, to curl, the tricep is the muscle you're using to uncurl, uh, to extend the, the forearm. Uh, flexing the forearm, extending the forearm, all right? I'm sure this is redundant to some of you guys and, and new. All right. So uh, here's a better view of this. Uh, here's the supraspinatus, the tricep, uh, the trapezius, pardon me, has been resected and, and cut back. It's been cut away here. And we see the supraspinatus. And then here's the infraspinatus. And both of them are traveling this way towards the head of the humerus. Uh, on the first or second day, I guess it would have been yesterday, at the end of class, no, it was in the, I don't remember. Anyways, when I showed you the uh, picture of the person with uh, fibrodysplasia ossificans progressiva, the SOP, the crazy skeleton, uh, this was the muscle that I was talking about that had been ossified. Uh, all right, yeah, so... Uh, there are these rhomboidal muscles deep to the trapezius that's been removed. If you, if you take it away, you see these rhomboidal muscles. And, and remember, remind yourself that a rhomboid, a rhombus, is a kind of like a diamond shape. It's a parallelogram that has been tilted. Uh, and we can see the uh, rhomboid major is the big one right here, and then the rhomboid minor is the smaller one, small rhomboidal uh, muscle that is superior to that. The rhomboids connect the medial margin of the scapula to the midline on the spine, on the vertebral column, and they bring those shoulder blades, uh, they're part of bringing the shoulder blades to the, uh, to, the, to the midline. In cold weather, people tend to have rhomboids that hurt because people like do this in the cold weather. And so those muscles uh, often can cramp up uh, when it's cold outside. Rhomboids.
All right. Uh, there's a better picture of the tricep brachii. So we see uh, the two heads. This is the uh, medial and lateral head. There's a there's a, a deep head there that you can't see. Uh, rhomboid major minor uh, have been revealed. The levator scapula. Um, if this was a more I guess maybe for some of you in medical school or someplace, but uh, you'll talk about the uh, developmental origins of the different uh, muscles. Tricep and levator scapula are two unusual muscles that they have a different embryological tissue origin than the other muscles. Uh, but uh, so that's significant for only some of you down the line. Uh, no. Anyways, levator scapula is a uh, like the rhomboids is going to pull the scapula towards the midline, but it's going to lift it up a lot. So levator also gets pretty tense in cold weather. Driving. God, if you get to class, I'm going to teach. I'm pretty good about it. Okay. Um, so the muscles of the arm. We have the bicep brachii, the two-headed muscle of the, fore, uh, of the arm, bicep brachii. A lot of people think it's the bicep that uh, gets so big uh, when, you, when you do the, the Popeye. It's actually not correct. Uh, there's a, a uh, bicep brachii is actually kind of a small muscle. There's, uh, it's, it's the muscle that uh, gets the train moving, but the, but the big uh, muscle of power in uh, flexion of the arm. It's called the brachialis uh, muscle, and you can see a little bit of it hidden here. To really see uh, the brachialis properly, you need to pull the bicep away. So, uh, Merrill, if you, if you did that there, you'd see the large brachialis muscle, which forms the bulk of uh, the bulge and somebody is showing off. Um, what else here? Uh, yeah, I don't really want to torture you guys with the muscles of the forearm. Do it, I guess. Um, so, you want to learn the muscles of the forearm? Yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> let's start with, uh, so this is a, a case of setting uh, an anchor and working off that anchor will help you, right? So uh, if you're gonna start from anatomical position, uh, lateral, let's start lateral, let's just start there. And uh, it's the brachioradialis. Brachio, because it's in the arm, uh, it, it attaches the arm to, uh, a, along the radius, all right? So the radius is the lateral bone of, uh, of the forearm. Uh, and the brachial radialis runs along the radius, uh, and attaches the brachium to the distal portion of the radius. Uh, next one down the line is the flexor carpi uh, radialis, uh, FCR. So uh, VR, FCR, flexor carpi uh, radialis is going to help you. Uh, so say you were going to. If I was going to flex the wrist, but only do it in such a way that I was bringing the thumb towards uh, medially, that would be uh, flexor carpi uh, radialis. Palmaris longus is in the middle. It's the long uh, muscle of the palm, and that is bringing the palm uh, forward uh, in, in, in a balanced way. And then there's the flexor carpi ulnaris, and that lays on top of the ulna. So we've just walked our way across the four large muscle groups, superficial muscle groups of the forearm. Brachioradialis, uh, flexor carpi radialis, palmaris longus, and then flexor carpi ulnaris. Um, B comes before C. Uh, F comes before P. I don't know, I'm making this up. Uh, and then uh, U, R comes before U. Maybe. Radialis on the radial side, ulnaris on the ulnar side, palmaris longus in the middle. 
And then the big one on the end there is the brachioradialis, if that helps. That's on the anterior side of the uh, hand. Then there is the important uh, flexor retinaculum. And the flexor retinaculum, retinaculum is um, like an aponeurosis, but aponeurosis is connecting muscle to muscle. Uh, retinaculum is tendinous, is a connective tissue tendinous sheet that's not connecting muscle at all. It's not really a ligament. Uh, it's a tendon, but it's, it's a retinaculum is holding, it's a connective tissue sheet that is providing a conduit for other tendons to work against is what it is. If we didn't have flexor retinaculum, when you went and did this with your muscle, the tendons would pop out like that, all right? The retinaculum keeps the tendons tucked up under uh, into the wrist. Does that make sense? The, the tendons would like pop out way down there. It is the flexor retinaculum that can be inflamed uh, in, um, in carpal tunnel syndrome uh, because the flex flexor retinaculum forms the roof of the carpal tunnel. All right. So I want to do the, the extensors. Well, there's an extensor retinaculum that does the same thing across the back. Um, let's not worry about the, the extensors. I, I want to actually make it uh, possible for you to memorize this stuff. Um, Supinator is, is pretty important, though. Uh, so, uh, if you were to pull the brachioradialis back, below it, you would see the supinator. Uh, the supinator is the muscle that pulls, that supinates the hand. It pulls the radius back. Uh, into anatomical position, supinates the hand, the supinator. That's an easy one. Uh, why don't we skip the, the deep muscles of the forearm too, the flexor pollicis longus and flexor digitorum profundus. It's not that they're not important, but... Yeah, there's another picture of the supinator. So I've uh, done a lot of uh, dissection here. This is quite a deep... Uh, section, but now you see the supinator uh, right above it in this part of the flesh that's been removed and visible. That would have been uh, the brachioradialis. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm cutting out a lot here, but we got to do some of it. Um, into the leg, gluteus maximus. Uh, there are actually three gluteal muscles. There's the gluteus maximus, uh, medius, and minimus. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to show the others, but the gluteus maximus is the big one on uh, uh, the surface. Then <clears throat> there is this IT band, uh, the iliotibial tract. The iliotibial tract is a broad aponeurotic sheet that uh, it's actually uh, mostly retinaculum that spreads from the iliac crest or the crest of your uh, the, the ilium on your pelvis all the way down to the lateral aspect of the knee. Uh, and it uh, provides uh, tension uh, that tension against which, the other muscles, particularly the adductors and the muscle, the large muscle groups to the medial side of the leg can work against. Uh, IT band is uh, difficult to stretch. It's important to stretch, difficult to stretch. Come to yoga, Ciao. Um, part of the IT band is dynamically responsive. Uh, you, can, you can dynamically tense uh, the uh, IT band using this small muscle group here called the tensor fascia lata. Uh, and it's, if you just go from the point of your wrist down onto the side of your hips, uh, you, you can feel the tensor fascia lata there. Um, so 
This large muscle that you see here underneath it is called the vastus lateralis, and that's one of the foreheads of the quadricep femoris, the foreheaded muscle of the, of the femur, quadricep femoris. Vastus, meaning large, lateralis on the lateral side. It's what lays right beneath the uh, IT band. Um, then looking on the back side of the leg, we have uh, the bicep femoris. Um, so there's the bicep brachialis, the two-headed muscle of the arm, and the bicep femoris, the two-headed muscle of uh, the thigh. Uh, and we see the short head here. Uh, there's going to be uh, a longer head as well. Oh, here is the long head. The short head. Um, rectus femoris is uh, the central muscle of the quadriceps. We'll see a picture of the leg uh, from the front in a minute. So <clears throat> uh, here is the gluteus maximus. Here's the tension fascia lata that we talked about. Uh, adductor magnus, we'll see a better picture of that later. But, uh, and then gracilis. The gracilis is a muscle that uh, attaches from the pubis to the uh, medial aspect of the knee. And it is the muscle that gives you the gracile balance of a, uh, a, a ballerina or a truly gifted wide receiver. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the gracilis, work your gracilis. Uh, and we're going to talk about the gracilis as a muscle group called the pes anserina in a moment. But we'll come back to the gracilis. Uh, here's the bicep femoris in a better view. We have um, the semitendinosus and the semimembranosus on the medial side. So the semitendinosus is uh, uh, the semitendinosus is the, the tendinous one that's superficial, and then there's a broad uh, semimembranosus or, or uh, thin membranous a part of that muscle. So on the lateral side is the bicep femoris, long and short head. On the medial side is semitendinosus and semimembranosus. The semitendinosus <coughs> is the second of the muscles in this muscle group I referred to, the pes anserina. You'll see it. I'll talk about that in a moment. But we have the semitendinosus here, the gracilis here. Uh, the last one we need to add is the sartorius, and we'll get to the front of the uh, leg in a moment for that. Okay. So, uh, what else here? The iliacus and the psoas major make up the iliopsoas. So this is the muscle that uh, it's really hard to access in terms of uh, therapeutic massage or body work, but all the hockey players love it uh, to get worked on because it's a muscle that helps flex the torso like this. And so hockey players who are always uh, bent over, however they do it like that, uh, their uh, iliopsoas muscle is often uh, inflamed. It originates along the vertebral column, deep in the abdomen, passes underneath the inguinal and uh, the inguinal ligament, and then inserts onto the femur. So it's going to bring that femur up towards uh, the torso, like that. So it's, it's a hip flex. Uh, sartorius is this muscle that crosses <coughs> medially, uh, heading distally, uh, across the front of uh, the thigh, uh, attaches at the iliac uh, crest down to the medial aspect. And the sartorius is the third muscle of uh, this, this muscle group that I'm going to point out. What does the word uh, sartorius suggest to you? Is that, have you ever heard a word that's related to it? Good word for the SAT, like that. Okay, so the word sartorial is the word I'm thinking of. What, does, does, what is the word sartorial? Have you guys heard that word before? Sartorial, uh, the sartorial uh, arts uh, refer to a tailor. Uh, so the sartorius, let's see if I can do this here. Uh, the sartorius is the muscle that a tailor would use. So they're sitting, 
they cross their knee and they're sewing something uh, on their knee that has been crossed. It's the sartorius that brings your, your knee, your leg across like this. It's the sartorius muscle. It's pulling that knee uh, up and laterally like this, sartorius. So the word sartorial means a tailor, a, a seamster or seamstress. All right. Beneath the uh, sartorius, if you were to resect the sartorius, like on this leg here, uh, Katie, would you please take the sartorius off of it? Uh, that is gracilis. Uh, no, no, that is the sartorius. Sorry. Yeah, that thing that she just re revealed, if you look at what she just revealed, that's called Hunter's Canal. Hunter's Canal. And it's basically like the, the super highway of the thigh. Uh, uh, injuries to Hunter's Canal can be uh, more destructive than a lot of the other places on the thigh. Uh, Hunter's Canal is a uh, passageway for a van. A neurovascular bundle, vein artery nerve. All right, there's there's uh, significant uh, the uh, superficial branch of the femoral artery passes through Hunter's Canal. Uh, the there's um, uh, a lot of nerves and veins passing through there, right beneath the sartorius. So now uh, let's. I want the medial view. Where's the medial view? Jeez. Okay. So what uh, would you put? the uh, sartorius back. Katie, do you think you're up to it? I think you can do it. All right. Might have to put the top in first. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. So now, <clears throat> um, if you look at uh, this muscle that she's just replaced, um, and where it inserts, it's distal insertion. So uh, I should say this too, that the origin of a muscle is where the muscle uh, attaches towards the midline. The proximal attachment uh, is, the, is the origin of the muscle. And the insertion is the distal at attachment of a muscle. Um, yeah, it's, I know. It's hard. I, it's, I, I just I set you up. So if you look at this, there's this thing, this group of muscles uh, called the pes anserina. Pes means, what's the word pes mean? We learned it the first day, P-E-S. Pes, pes. Foot, yeah. Anserina uh, is, I think it's Roman for uh, crow. So it forms the crow's foot, this muscle group right here. The sartorius the gracilis, and the semitendinosus. You can see how the three of them insert on the medial side of uh, the knee in this, uh, this group of three thin muscles called the pes anserina that goes up uh, towards uh, the hip, all right? The sartorius, gracilis, and the semitendinosus, all right, the, the crow's foot. I don't have a good picture of it, but. Uh, yeah. Well, here's a good picture of the iliopsoas. Uh, and it's good for you to know that because the iliopsoas is, I think, if the model, the, mod, the piece of art might not be out there, but I think I'm putting the iliopsoas on the. If it is, if the art that I'm thinking of is there, that one's going to go on the thing tomorrow. So, iliopsoas. Uh, here it's, it's made of the iliacus and the psoas muscle. Uh, the iliacus uh, is, named, is named after the iliac crest that it attaches to. 
Uh, the oleaticus comes down, passes underneath that inguinal ligament, and then uh, inserts on the lesser. Okay. You okay? What happened? Um, so, <clears throat> uh, inserting on the lesser tubercle of the femur, and then we have a psoas major uh, that comes down off of the, the lumbar vertebra, and along with the eliacus, inserts on the same tubercle, uh, helping to flex that knee. You can see how, if he's contracted, it would pull that knee up. All right, so the iliopsoas muscle. Um, the adductors. Uh, um, there is uh, the adductor magnus, which is the deepest of them. It's this broad, broad sheet uh, that inserts on uh, the pubis and uh, and uh, along the whole medial aspect of uh, the femur. Along, what's the name of that line? There's a ridge. I forget what the name of the ridge, the femoral ridge is called. Maybe it's called. Anyways, it inserts on the medial side of the femur, and it is an adductor. Oh, yeah, I need to tell you what those words mean. So uh, the word adductor uh, means to... Uh, add something, to bring an appendage towards the midline. An abductor, an abductor, uh, bring, take something away from the midline. So an ab to abduct is to bring your arms away from the midline, and to adduct, uh, it brings it to the, to the midline. You often hear people, just to be clear, because those words sound similar, will say adduct or abduct. way you say it is abduct or adduct. Um, all of these are adductors. It's an adductor group. It's going to bring the leg towards the midline. It's going to bring, so uh, if I was going against resistance, I mean gravity is helping me here, but if I was uh, working against resistance, I would be using these muscles to adduct uh, my leg. Um, yeah, so there's an adductor magnus. Uh, I don't have any of those other ones listed, which is good. Uh, and then the um, superficial is adductor longus. Uh, gracilis is also an adductor, but um, it, it's, its actions are more nuanced. Uh, I guess I didn't talk about the piriformis. I'm going to point it out. It's not going to be in the quiz, the test, or whatever it is. Uh, but this muscle here is called the piriformis, and this is an anterior view, so you may think it's anterior, but actually it's quite posterior. The reason I'm pointing it out is um, that people who get sciatica, uh, has anyone heard of sciatica before? Yeah, sciatica is like literally a pain in your ass. Um, it's it's a, a, an acute pain that happens, that radiates down your leg, because the sciatic nerve, the giant nerve uh, that serves all the big muscles in your leg gets compressed uh, by this muscle, the piriformis. And the piriformis uh, can go into spasm because you are students sitting on your butt and not a teacher dancing around with you. Um, so yeah, just like sitting, uh, the action of sitting tends to uh, inflame the, uh, the piriformis. Am I making fun of you guys? No. I love y'all. <coughs> you can... Yeah, years absolutely, absolutely. It's a Western phenomenon in cultures that sit in chairs less and sit on uh, the ground more. It's less of a problem. But you can stretch the piriformis by doing this kind of thing. Pigeon is, is a good yoga pose for it. All right, that's just some pathology. I guess uh, I don't have a good model that shows the piriformis, although I'm sure you could identify it in this thing if you took it apart enough. Uh, almost there. Gastrocnemius, that is not how you pronounce that word. It's pronounced gastronemus. 
but gastrocnemius, uh, the C-N-E-M, is not a common word, uh, letter combination that you see in words. Um, it is <coughs> the uh, stomach-shaped muscle of the calf, the gastronemius. There's a medial head and a lateral head. Gastro meaning stomach. It's shaped like a stomach. Uh, and not, it doesn't really look like a stomach here, but if you were to uh, cut the tendon or if you contract it strongly, uh, you would see that it, it kind of folds up into a stomach shape. Uh, this is uh, for the uh, extension of the foot. This is what helps you stand on your toes, keep on your toes. Um, if you were to remove the gastronemius, uh, you would see uh, a larger muscle beneath it called the soleus. Now the bulk of your calf, at, just like the bulk of your forearm or your arm is the brachialis, the bulk of your uh, calf is actually soleus. Right? Um, and again, I'm, I'm just trying to drop as many pearls uh, for those of you who go on to uh, medical school or something like that, so maybe they'll, they'll help you. Sometimes, I don't know what medical school is like nowadays, if people have pearls or not, but uh, this muscle here is, it is not on the test, but this is just for a few of you for your own FYI or anything, uh, is called uh, the plantaris muscle, uh, and they, they call it the freshman nerve. It's, it's uh, sometimes called the freshman nerve because first-year medical students, when they're in anatomy, uh, this gets labeled a lot uh, because for most of the length of that muscle, or it look, it's tendon, and it looks like a nerve. I mean, you know, don't feel bad. Aristotle made the same mistake. Uh, but uh, there is a little bit of muscle fiber up here in the popliteal fossa, but for the length of the calf, it's all tendon, uh, and it looks like a nerve. Uh, but it's it's the it's the uh, plantaris muscle it gives you proprioceptive information uh, proprioceptive information about uh, the speed and uh, intensity of your dancing I guess um, the uh, calcaneal tendon is the tendon that all three of these muscles the two heads of the gastrocnemius and the soleus uh, come and insert on the calcaneus the calcaneus is your heel bone heel bone, it's one of the tarsal bones, it's your heel bone, so the calcaneal tendon uh, inserts there. Uh, that was the tendon that was severed by, uh, uh, who, was, who was the, uh, help me out, the Greek mythology? Achilles. Huh? Achilles, yeah, thanks, God. Achilles, uh, the, the great uh, hero had his tendon. Who was it? It was, was it Artemis? Paris, that's it, that's it, you're right. Good job. Uh, um, well, five minutes, we're done. Mm, what do I want to say here? So there's the fibularis longus, there is a fibularis uh, brevis, but uh, the other name for these are the peroneals. You, you hear that word often, the peroneals. Uh, also known as the fibularis uh, group, fibularis longus and uh, brevis. And they help uh, with lateral stabilization of the ankle. Lateral stabilization of the ankle. Uh, tibialis anterior, this is the muscle that runners uh, who don't stretch properly get uh, shin splints, is what they call it, right? Has anyone had that before? It's just the pain down the front of your uh, foreleg. Uh, this is the tibialis anterior. Uh, let's not worry about the, ex the uh, sensor digitorum longus. I mean, we could. It's this one here. Well, we're not going to worry about any of them, are we? We're not here to worry. Uh, we're here to learn. Tibialis anterior, the superficial muscle that's just uh, medial to that would be uh, the extensor digitorum longus. Um, yeah, the gastrocnemius actually looks pretty stomach-like here in that uh, depiction. I think uh, this is all this is all redundant on the medial side. 
And the only other muscle is the flexor digitorum brevis. It's the muscle right on the superficial uh, aspect of the, of, the, of the sole of your foot. Um, okay, that's it.